I think an important starting point is shame does not serve us in any way at all. It's quite a destructive emotion. It's like there is no benefit to it. So just take it off the table and, you know, look at other ways. What sort of support do you need to keep on moving forward? There is space for all of us to be who we are. When we're authentic, we're actually operating at our best. I need to listen to them more and then communicate so you can be heard. Hello and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the entrepreneurial operating system. My guests come onto the show to kind of share the highs and lows of running a business, but also I often have experts on the show. And today is one of those experts. So today's guest has been likened to Winston Churchill. She has survived aggressive breast cancer, has developed four tenants to get through the cancer. And today she's going to share with you how you can use those four tenants to get through difficult times in business and personal. Cara McCourty is the founder, coach, and speaker at EQE Coaching. Welcome to the show, Cara. Thank you very much, Deborah. It's always lovely to have you here. So Cara and I have been friends for a long, long time. And in fact, Cara is a leadership coach, which means that uh, where I do the EOS stuff, if any of my leaders need help, I rely on people like Cara to actually help them. So why don't you tell us a bit about your, your story? Because I mean, that's some really impressive things. In there. I know. Winston, <laughs> I know. Winston, Winston Churchill is a bit of a biggie. So, so yeah. So look, I started in brand marketing and, you know, I've, I've worked in New Zealand, UK and London and Australia. And then when I was in Australia, I transitioned into executive coaching. I got trained out of the US in an accredited corporate coaching school and set up a very successful coaching, training, and also speaking business. And, and with the coaching, always sort of targeted, you know, business leaders, business owners. And that was going really, really well. And it was around, so I started that around about 2000. And around 2005, I wanted to get online. You know, how do I do the online stuff? And it was there I ended up falling into literally digital marketing and some strategies around you know, internet marketing that I had a lot of success with. So then I started doing that and also the coaching. And then with the digital side and my marketing background, it involved, evolved into marketing consulting for SMEs. So I was running two businesses, both the coaching and also the marketing consulting business. And so just to make my plate even a little bit more full, I also set up a health and wellness business with a business partner. And unfortunately, that one didn't stand the test of time because they decided that their heart wasn't in it anymore. And because they were the expert on the health side of things, we closed that business. And then after my treatment with breast cancer and, and you know everything I went through there, I realized even though I've got a lot of skills in marketing, my passion, my true core is with coaching and working you know, one-on-one -on -one with people. I, I really want people to trust themselves and, and know that they, they've got this and that they do have the answers and that they can achieve the results that they want. And I love helping them do that. Perfect. Okay. So that's kind of how you, so you said you got trained over in the US. Yes. Yeah. So how was that doing the training from the US? That was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And I, and I built a really good network, amazing network of, of fellow coaches. And I even spoke at their ICF conferences as well. So I think what I saw with my career, I've always had a global focus. So love New Zealand, love Australia, but I've also done a lot of work with clients in the US and also the UK. I've got Canada and I have had one client, English speaking in Germany, but you know, so I've gone continental as well. Absolutely. That sounds fantastic. Okay, cool. So tell me, you mean, there's some really amazing things you've gone through in life. We're going to cover those off in more detail very shortly. What are the sort of two things that you're most proud of? Professionally and personally, what would you say the things you're most proud of? Well, being likened to Winston Churchill was... You must tell us more about that. Yeah. yeah. So that was back in the days when I was brand marketing and I won the 
contract with Air New Zealand for business class with Paul Roger Champagne. And Christiane de Paul Roger, excuse my <laughs> poor French, sent me this fax in those days, likening me to Winston Churchill. I'm like, wow, I, you know, I, I got those two famous quotes that, that we know for Winston Churchill. And yeah, it, it was their way. They had a close association with the Churchill family. So I suppose it was their way to communicate how delighted because it just meant it, it tripled the volume of their sales. So they were very, very happy. And then the... Just to pause for a second yes. there. Is that where your love of champagne comes from? Because yes, I know that, that you really enjoy bubbles. Well, no, as you're no, like, no, no. Actually, before then. So so when I did the OE round Europe with my two girls, uh, girl, uh, girlfriends in a combi van, we went to, you know, Epinay and Hlans. I never say that correctly. Yeah. And we ended up at the Porrige Boutique Champagne Chateau. And I just fell in love with it. So it was from there. So then when I moved into what was then Allied Liquor and, and working in marketing there, I said, please, can I look after that brand? They had that brand. So yeah, that's that was sort of like the trajectory for that. So I developed the love of champagne, I think, when I was traveling around France. Yes. <laughs> so, so yes, and but it's always... Exactly. Well, well Porrige has always been one of my favorites. So but they're all my favorites. Anything that's French champagne is always good, right? Yeah. Proper, proper champagne. Okay, great. And so what about um, personally? You know, obviously you've gone through some pretty major things in your life. Yeah, I, I think two things there is, yes, I've been through the breast cancer, but even before that, I returned to New Zealand from 18 years in Sydney to take on primary caregiving um, role for my late father. And then when he passed away, then my mother. And that for me was the most, I suppose, rewarding career position. I've had it was harrowing and it was also a huge privilege and it really required my leadership skills and my coaching skills to go through that. I knew nothing about caregiving, both from the system perspective and also the, you know, practical nursing um, perspective. So I'm very, very proud of that. I'm also pleased to be out the other side of breast cancer and to be termed cancer free. And, you know, of course, I've, I've learned a lot about that. Like any world, it's a niche, you know, like it, it's a whole world. And I've learned about how many different types of breast cancer there are, you know, different treatment regimes based on your type of breast cancer and the stages that it's at and everything like that. And, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm happy with how I approach that. And I did develop four tenants to help me get through it, which I think were instrumental. And it wasn't like I sat down and went, I'm going to do this they evolved and, and they, they were just like, yeah, my, my linchpins to get through it. Because you, you, can, you can sort of, you know, smile about it now and, and you had done an amazing job to come through it. But at the time, it was, it was a bit of a shock from what I understand. And, and you had no idea what to expect. And it went on, the treatment went on for, what, 18 months? Yeah, it's, it's still, and I'm still considered in recovery. So I'm cancer-free, but I'm still in, in recovery. And that's another thing. It doesn't just stop with the act of treatment. And again, I knew none of these terms. So I'm using them like there every day, but I don't expect other people to, to know them. So with active treatment, so I started off, it was going to be one and done and I never had a lump, but then when it was discovered, it was rather huge. What they took out was eight and a half centimeters. So you'd think, well, how could you miss that? But it really was not a lump. And because I've got dense breasts, which is a whole other subject, it didn't show up on a mammogram. So even in the day when it was discovered by the ultrasound, the mammogram and 3D mammogram were all clear. Dense breasts mean that you see a sea of white. Um, a breast cancer is uh, cancer is white. What I didn't know then is dense breasts. You have you know double the chance of getting cancer, breast cancer. Yeah. So, but a lot of women. I'm I'm actively involved with spreading the word around dense breasts because our public system at the moment isn't built to support that. In the past, when I went for my mammograms, it was almost like I was. I made their job harder because of my dense breasts. So I used to feel bad that I was making their heart job harder because it's hard to get a clear picture, but I didn't understand everything that I know now. So with after that first surgery, the lymph nodes with all the screening I had, which was the ultrasound and the MRI, showed the cancer, but didn't the lymph nodes were clear, learned that pathology has the last say. And after that surgery, so I had a and, and and reconstruction immediately 
they had found it in five of five lymph nodes resected. So that's when it moved, and this is my terminology, from one and done to full Monty. And the full Monty meant 21, 21 weeks of chemo and it was meant to be 20, but I also went through the floods, so they gave me an extra week. 21 weeks of chemo, then more surgery to remove from lymph nodes. Everything that they do that's designed to save your life also comes with a mighty punch and side effects. And then, you know, radiation and, yeah, and here I am. And hair, hair's regrowing back and it's curly now. No, that's, that's <laughs> like, really lovely. It's actually really lovely. It's starting to really suit you now. It's getting a length on it too. But, yeah, so it's interesting, isn't it, because we're going to talk about the things that you actually developed to help you kind of get through that time. And as you said, they developed over time. They weren't just things you wrote down. But these things are also really helpful for any time in your life, right, when you're going through. Oh, ab- absolutely, kind of absolutely. You talked in the beginning, you know, leaders often can have some doubt, some self-doubt about, you know, whether or not they can do this. They, they'll often have times when, I know when I'm and leading people where you start to, you know, wonder is it all worth it and everything feels like it's overwhelming on top of you. So why don't you share a little bit with us about these four tenants and then we can explore what that means from a business point of view. So the four tenants that I developed, the first one was and shall I talk about it like in the breast cancer sense and then we'll talk about it, how it can translate to business. So so with what I was going through, what came out was to feel no shame. I was absolutely determined that I wasn't going to feel shame about the changes that are happening to my body. It was beyond my control and it's not to, I liken it to a war wound. And again, this is you know, giving full acknowledgement to those that have actually fought, but then I, you know, they're fighting for their lives and fighting for a cause. I've also been fighting for for my life. So I I just refuse to feel no shame about things looking different there, that I've got scars. And, you know, to feel no shame for asking for help, to feel no shame about any of it. You know, I, I was in a very vulnerable situation. I'm used to being very independent to, you know, to leading and and this was really a time where you know it it was about being open to and receiving you know support which went into the second one which was say yes to everything and and with the saying yes to everything you know we're often taught taught in a leadership perspective learn to say no the flip of that is actually to receive help and I knew somehow that I couldn't do this alone and so I said yes to the medical you know, support the adjacent support, like from Breast Cancer Foundation, Dove House, Cancer Society, all of them amazing. I said yes to friends offering to do things for me, said yes to counseling without knowing if I need it, said yes to physiotherapy. I basically said yes. I knew it was going to be a team that would get me through this. And and yeah, I'm really glad I did. Even if I didn't know what I was signing up for, I just thought I, I need all hands on deck you know, to help me through this. And then the third one was to find the joy in a lot of darkness. And, you know, for me, that was exercise to a very reduced capacity. I signed up for, and it was a friend of mine in Sydney that told me about this. You know, she's gone through a really, I mean, all cancer is challenging, a very, even more brutal cancer. And unfortunately, she's fighting for her life um, again. And the CEP is a clinical exercise physiologist and they're designed to work with people like if you've got a heart condition, diabetes and and also cancer, you know, people going through cancer. And that just meant that it was a controlled environment. And what I loved, and this was even more joy, is I did it through the Auckland University system. So I'm helping masters of science students get their degrees. So that filled my heart with so much joy and they're helping me and I felt safe. And it was a, you know, dramatically reduced capacity and and also going for walks. Again, friends were kind to go for a walk and a walk that would normally take, you know, maybe an hour could take three hours. It was because I needed to rest a lot. French bubbles, you know, when I was well enough between, you know, treatments and that, not all the time, but there'd be occasions that that just helped me. And, and rightly or wrongly, I looked at it like I'm getting a lot of poison put in my body to to heal me with the chemo. So I know that you know champagne, all alcohol are poisons, but this brings me joy. And it was completely signed off, you know, by my medical team. Of course, always with moderation. And then the fourth one was celebrate the milestones, which relates into the 
the find the joy. But I think also what's important here, and I'll talk about this in a business sense as, as well, is a lot of those milestones weren't exactly cherry ones. So somehow I knew that I needed to crowdsource, you know, support. So so when I got my diagnosis, we were all hoping it was going to be a papillomatosis, which is a breast wart, charming. And then, you know, got the, you know, the, the life-changing news. And, you know, I rang around my f- friends and family that were coming. My sister was with me. And I said, do you still want us to come? I said, yes, absolutely. So having, so that wasn't exactly a celebration, woohoo. It was still a time of love and, you know, connection. And it was a huge life event. And so that happened, you know, throughout, even when I first went to the oncologist and second actually oncologist, when I learned about my stats, which aren't, you know, exactly what I'd like after they found the lymph nodes, it's a 58% 10 year survival rate. And I remember because I'd seen another oncologist and that was brutal as, as well. The second one, I thought, oh, you know, I've been told the 58 and people around me said, oh, but you're fit and healthy. So it's going to be better. You know, you're good for your age. So I asked her, I said, oh, oh, you know, given I'm fit and healthy, you know, could it be better than that? And she very dryly looked at me and correctly said, I can't tell you what side of the 58% you're going to be on. That was the first time that death was put on the table for me that, you know, I could do everything right and I may die. So again, that required a milestone. <laughs> that, that was huge news that now each part is a step and not all, all of it was good news, but having that recognition of the, you know, it was a significant event really helped me. And also like all through each stage of treatment and, and, you know, this clearly relates to, to business as well, like one step closer to the end goal, which is like being through active treatment and being alive. Perfect. Okay. So let's start thinking about some of those things from a, a business perspective. So fear or no shame. I mean, I must admit, I just actually had a skin cancer removed yesterday and I've got, I remember when I signed the, the form from the doctor and it said, you know, that, yeah, it said something along the lines of, you know, scarring is kind of natural and we can't guarantee that you won't have a scar and we can't guarantee it will go away. And I think if I'd been in my twenties, I would have gone, oh no, I don't want a scar. I'm 54 this week, next week. And I was like, I knew that was going to come and, you know, I'm going to get a scar. That's absolutely fine. And I'm not, I'm not worried about it anymore, but feel no shame in the business sense can mean that you can take some of these things and you can really make mountains out of molehills sometimes, can't you? Well, you know, wherever we're at with our own business, and again, whether we are self-employed or we do have a team of people that we're, you know, ultimately responsible for, you know, not everything goes to plan. We may have made some choices that don't serve us or we've done everything that we back on and think was right, but it still didn't play out and it's just important not to feel bad about that not to feel bad about yourself to feel shame that you're not where you want to be there's always that opportunity to get where you want to be it just means that there's maybe more learning different strategies I I really like it's one of my favorite sayings is Virginia Satur the she was a clinical psychologist and she did what she called a silly study so and that was how many ways are there to wash dishes in order to get dry, you know, clean dishes, clean dishes, I should say. And there was 250 different ways. So I use that as a great metaphor that even if things aren't going as you want, there's always a solution. It's about, you know, implementing, you know, developing a strategy, implementing it. If it's not giving you the results you want, pivot and then, you know, trial again. And of course, there's going to be times where we don't feel so cheery and there's you know tools we can use for that to you know to keep that flame burning but I think an important starting point is shame does not serve us in any way at all it's quite a destructive emotion it's like there is no benefit to it so just take it off the table and you know look at other ways what what sort of support do you need to keep on moving forward I think you make a really good point it's like yeah at the end of the day we we get taught in, in university and business studies that, you know, businesses grow on this beautiful kind of um, S-shaped curve and it's all beautiful, smooth sailing. But business isn't like that. Oh. You know, we hit points where it just, you can't, you can't do anything and, and things go wrong and you have to, you have to change and you have to accept it and you have to move forward. I had a really, I had, I had lunch with a friend today and one of the things that they sort of said to me, there's, you can have somebody who's got 20 years of experience 
But 20 years of experience can be seen in kind of two ways. It could either be somebody who's had actually only really one year of experience, but 20 times over, which means they've repeated the same thing over and over again. Or you've got somebody who's genuinely got 20 years of experience because every experience they've had, they've learned from, they've moved forward, and so therefore they're growing into the next experience. And I think that is part of, of business. It's like if you keep repeating the same thing over and over again, not quite so great. But if you can take it and you can learn from it, don't feel any shame about the failure, but what can I take from it to move forward is the only way you'll, you'll get through it, right? Absolutely. I think if anything, it's, it's the capacity to learn is more important than um, berating ourselves if things don't you know, pan out the way that we had hoped. Perfect. Okay. So next one, say yes to everything. And I love the way that you put this because, yes, we are always taught that we should say no to more things. But this isn't about we still got to prioritize and make sure we are saying yes to the right things. But this is about actually asking for help, isn't it? And it's tough as a business owner or as a, even as a leader in, a, in an organization because asking for help sometimes feels like you're admitting that you're no good or that you're not good enough to actually do that. So how, if somebody sort of, you know, somebody wants to ask for help, but they feel like, oh, if I ask for help, it makes me look stupid. What would you suggest to them? I would want to, first of all, understand more about what they're, you know, what's driving that, that they feel that that's a, that's a negative thing. You know, again, I'm not a therapist, so it's not about going back into their, their childhood and and that, but just to really understand, you know, what, what the driver is and then, you know, work through that and then, you know, look at how is that you know, working for you to, to hold that belief, look at what could be some other ways, you know, that they could look at things and, you know, help them or how can they go from there to there and, and to modify that belief. Because sometimes we really want to hold on to something. You know, we, we have this sort of unintentional or unconscious righteousness. Well, you know, I've got to do it by myself because if I don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's working through that belief and, and, Ideally, if the person is, is receptive to it, replacing it with a belief that they actually feel they can connect with, an alternative belief. But essentially, you know, we there's so many studies out there that, that prove that as human beings we need to connect. And, you know, we, we've gone into our own businesses for a particular reason. You know, we're, we're a particular makeup of, of people that do. But that doesn't mean that we're lone wolves. You know, we still need that connection and it's about working with other people in a way that's going to help us get the results that we want. I see. I love it. Yeah. So it's exploring where our beliefs are coming from, trying to understand, not, I said, not going back to childhood. No, but no, just... that's not my territory, <laughs> no. no. But, but being able to replace it with something that actually really ties you in kind of emotionally to, to the, the decision that you're now making, therefore you can actually change the way you approach it and and one of the first things could be that that there may be something there that it is considered a bad thing to ask for help you know that that they have again not going to therapy territory but more rewarded or they feel more validated if they've you know struggled themselves and and, and yeah so it's working through that and sometimes environments can make it difficult I mean, we once did a talk at a very very big law firm here in Auckland and it was about the imposter syndrome and we sent the invites out to, to for this talk and we weren't getting very many responses. And what we actually found out was that the calendars, because we were all on Microsoft Office, the calendars were shared amongst everybody. And people were actually scared of accepting the invitation because if they accepted the invitation, it popped into their calendar and it was a workshop about imposter syndrome. And so they were concerned that people would then think that, well, you know, you're, you've obviously got an issue, you're going to an imposter syndrome workshop. So we actually had to change the title of it just to ensure that people didn't feel nervous about coming along to it. But environments can do that. They can make it difficult for you. Absolutely. That, that is a fantastic, you know, fantastic example. It's, and, and, you know, I've heard people say, oh, yes, but when I've asked for help or I've got help, you know, it hasn't been very good. You know, it's, it's not, you know, a, I'm better off to do it myself. So what I would say to that, well, is like, let's look at what broke down in that chain. You know, was it the brief? You know, do we need to work on the brief? And and I've seen that with with clients before where they don't provide a great brief. I've seen that back in my advertising days. And on the client side, you know, it can be that side or also, you know, who who they've picked. It might be the wrong company that they're working with is not in alignment with values or you don't know to you you know to you work with somebody there's always a solution if 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 10 people don't work out 
you know, look at that. It maybe if 10 people don't work out, it might be like, look at yourself, but also the 11th could. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a really good point, actually. Yeah. I think the brief is really important. I know, I know actually in my own business sometimes because I think so fast and because I talk so fast, I think I've said something really, really clearly, but the person hasn't necessarily heard what I thought I have said. So I always turn it back on myself and go, okay, so it's actually my responsibility to make sure they have heard what I thought I was trying to say. And I'll ask them to kind of repeat back to me what I've, what they've heard me say. And then it gives me a chance to go, oh, no, that's actually not what I meant. This is what I was actually thinking. Absolutely. And, and you know, I like the phrase communicate so you, so you can be heard. And, you know, I think I'm a great communicator. I've had that same sort of situation where it's like, oh, they're just not getting it. But I'm, I'm a good communicator. I'm really clear. It's like, no, no. What language are they speaking? And I'm not talking beyond English like that. It's just like, okay, so I'm not actually connecting with them. I'm not resonating. I need to, I need to listen to them more and then speak in, in terms, you know, respectful terms in a way that they, you know, can understand. And that's how, you know, that whole communicates so you can be heard. And, you know, we all go through that. Not e even though we may be speaking the same English, we're also not. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good, good point. Okay. Find the joy. I mean, that's, that's going to always be a chain. Business, we all have bad days, right? Whether you're a leader, whether you're a business owner, you're going to have days sometimes where you just kind of go, what is, you know, what is going on? So how does it, how do we find the joy on those days? Well, I think for me, what works, and this is about people finding what brings them joy. So it's asking, well, what do I like to do? I would suggest something healthy rather than something destructive for ourselves. You know, so you may enjoy a couple of glasses of wine, but to have two bottles of that may not be so, so good. But, you know, like for me, it's like walking really helps, you know, connection with others, just, you know, stepping away is, is really good. Time with my animals, um, you know, that, that brings me absolute joy. So I look for ways when things are, you know, like if I need to shift my state, you know, my, where I'm at, because we can start to go down a rabbit hole, you know, e even as a positive person, I can feel myself like, oh, you know, and, and you start to drown almost so it's like well okay so I'm not feeling great what can I do right now I'm opening the fridge and you know eating your feelings it doesn't necessarily you know that brings momentary joy but something like a walk or you know like what I've suggested connection with others they're really healthy ways I think just to find joy I love mornings so it's it's also I suppose I could get up in the morning and ignore that it's a beautiful day or I can get up in the morning and see, my goodness, what a beautiful day. Let me go outside and, and smell that, you know, for me, morning air. Or if night, it's like, oh, wow, gosh, that, you know, really beautiful, clear sky. So it's just really moving from that cloud that we have going on into sunshine for ourselves. And I think we talked about this before we came into the podcast studio, but it's also about it is about understanding what is right for you because we often kind of get into the fall into the trap of we should do or we ought to do or this is what everybody else does. I mean, a classic example is one of my clients who runs, actually she's my podcast editor, so hi, hi Neil. He will actually, he's, he came to me and said, oh, you know, I've got this list of things that I want to do in the business and, and one of the things when he had like a, a sports car and he wanted a, a flash watch. And I just said to him, do you wear a watch? Do you use a watch? And he's like, well, no, not really. And it's like, so why would you want a watch? He's like, well, that feels like it's success. And it's like, well, it might be for some people, but really, if you don't like watches, there's no point at all. I actually love watches and I have a really beautiful watch because I always wear a watch and I love using the, you know, seeing the time. But for some people, that's not important. I love fast cars and sports cars. And so for me, having a fast car and a sports car is not about a status symbol, but it's about the joy of driving it. I love driving really fast cars. So what we were talking about with him was that actually, you know, we often get forced down. My parents were very traditional. They, they wanted me to find a good husband, settle down, get married, have children. That was what they wanted for me turns out it wasn't what I wanted for myself. And so we've got to be very careful that the, the things that bring us joy is not the same. So what brings you joy may not bring me joy and vice versa. Absolutely. And I think shoulds Horrible can be word. there. Yeah, <laughs> it is. And you know, the shoulding all over yourself. So yes. yeah, it, it's really looking at, and this is where it's important with any of the tenants, anything in life, ask yourself quality questions. Now those quality questions, you know, the theory is open-ended, uh, 
the most productive. Also, closed-ended, so yes or no answers can also help because that can help us get clarity. And then the open-ended helps us dig in further. And ask yourself questions to find out what it is that you really want. What is it that brings you joy or what is it that you need support in if we're, if we're saying yes to everything? So asking yourself those questions, removing like I should be a certain way, I need to... I need to listen to them because they know more. They may have more experience and they're also wired their way. You're wired your way. So look at that person and see where, you know, is, is it actually a match? There may be somebody else that has more experience that might be a better match for, you know, for your wiring. Because it's not, I always say to clients, advocate stretching because that's how you grow. But we don't want to stretch to the point that we break because we're trying to, you know, make ourselves a different person. I also use another analogy, square peg, round hole. You know, these are all common ones, but they're really important. So I often in my mind go through things like that. So it's like, well, okay, here, is this really a square peg, you know, in a round hole? It doesn't mean I'm wrong. I I might feel that. And then it's it's like, okay, but that's not really me. You know, like going through that round hole, that's not right for me. And like you said, it doesn't mean that square is right or wrong or sort of circle is right or wrong, but it's just about um, being in the right position. I think this happens a lot in business. It's like we talk about obviously values in the business and, and personal values as well. There has to be an alignment there. And just because you don't share the core values of the business that you're working with, that does not make you a, a, a bad person. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. It just means you're not aligned with that organization. There'll be another organization out there that will absolutely, you know, you'll you'll just fit into that beautiful round hole because you're a round peg and everything's great yes exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny because i think we, we we tend to we do we put all these labels on things around you know what what people should or shouldn't be or what they um you know what we expect of them there's a there's a place for all of us yes. to be the way that we are yeah i think and this is why i really want to encourage people and again i work mainly with you know business leaders they're still human. They still have, you know, they may have achieved a lot of success and they're, they still got, you know, thoughts, feelings, insecurities, doubts. It, it's like knowing that we do, who we are as we are is, is really fabulous. Of course, we can always learn. We can always grow. We can modify behaviors. The starting point isn't a pile of crap. The start, starting point is really, you know, I, like a diamond. It's just helping you shine more brightly, recognizing that your multifacets are fantastic as they are. Diamonds and shine. I know. You've got, you've got me. I'm, I'm in. I'm all in. Now. You can see what brings me joy. <laughs> you can, you can. Okay. So the last thing was about celebrating the milestones. And I think this is one of the things I have to say, I'm not sure New Zealanders do particularly well in terms of not just, I mean, you talk about all the milestones, but in business, even the small wins. Like I, I, I've said a, a few times in the media just recently is that I work between Australia and New Zealand and I can have an Australian team. And let's just say we had like three measure, we've got re- revenue, profit, and a couple of measurables. So that's four things. And they've got four rocks they had to achieve in the quarter. If the Australian team gets kind of three out of the four of the measurables and three out of four of the the, the rocks and I ask them to grade that quarter in terms of how they think that quarter went they'll go oh it's an A maybe maybe you know they'll go it's A, a minus I ask the same of, of a Kiwi team and often with exactly the same numbers exactly the same achievement rates they'll be like oh it's probably a C and it's like oh, wow it's really amazing that we are so harsh on ourselves over here and I think it's because we don't celebrate the small wins so if we, if we keep celebrating all the little milestones we're in the right frame of mind to celebrate the bigger successes as well. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And, and you know, I've lived in both countries yeah. and they're very different. You know, the cultures of both, even though people, you know, often lump the two together, having lived in both, very, very different. And, and you've identified that. And, you know, New Zealanders also like to celebrate, but potentially a, a different way <laughs> to, to Australians are very comfortable in acknowledging themselves as, as a rule and New Zealanders tend to not be they're a little bit more you know low-key they like to be you know I think that's part of the branding um, of, of, a, of a Kiwi so again not <laughs> not projecting on every every New Zealander yeah, so what is important about it is yes celebrating the milestones that are clearly wins but also celebrating the milestones where you may not have won because you still put the work in. So let's say, you know, thinking back in, in my 
you know, our advertising career, we might pitch for a new business. And, you know, we've still put that effort in and, and you know, we might have worked ridiculous hours to pitch to to a prospective client. If we don't get it, that doesn't mean that we haven't put in that effort, that we haven't worked well as a team, that, you know, we have still won in a way. We may not have that new business, but it's still we've gone through that effort. That's why I made that distinction with, you know, when I was celebrating the milestones through my treatment, not all of them were, you know, happy, clappy events. So, and so too in business, I think it's just when you work together, so let's say it's a team event, whatever the outcome, acknowledge and celebrate that. As an individual, it's really important to acknowledge, you know, achievements. I I mentioned to you, I'm moving at the moment and, you know, certainly got myself into a little bit of a whirlwind mentally about all the things I've got to do and I could feel myself starting to get too much into I think it was turning into into a um, twister there so what I did was take a step back and actually acknowledge all that I'd achieved that I'd actually hit all these milestones because what was happening was it's like oh yes I've done that but I've got this I've got this I've got this I've got this to do and it's like yes and I've done this that the other And, and I think that's really important in a business context there's always going to be more work to do. Acknowledge everything that you've achieved. And that can also help refuel us to keep going. It's really interesting. Dan Sullivan, I think with, is it Hardy is his last name. I can't remember what his name is. They've actually written a book. And, and one of the, the key things is about always measure backwards. Because if you're always chasing the thing that's ahead, like you said, there's always something more ahead. But you've got to actually look and go, how am I now compared to a year ago? Wow, look how far I've come. And that's really important is to do that measure backwards. Because if you're always just chasing the next thing, they, they gave a really great example of a guy who was like, you know, once I get to 2 million, then I'll be happy. Then it was like 4 million, then I'll be happy. Then at 6 million, then I'll be happy. And he never got to happiness, right? Because you're always chasing the next thing and there's nothing, you're not acknowledging, wow, I came from nothing to 4 million. That's pretty impressive, you know? So I think that, that you're right. It's not just about celebrating all the successes, but it's just about thinking about what you've actually achieved in that journey. Oh, I wonder if it's like sometimes we don't because we don't want to seem like the tall poppy. We don't want to seem like we're full of ego or full of bravado. We don't want to be flashy or, or whatever's going on for the individual. It's not about that. It's actually really, again, about that, self-acknowledgement about building that relationship with ourselves none of us are perfect we all have our off days and there is an awful lot of good about us so acknowledge that acknowledge when we are actually happy with our performance and when we're not what can we learn from that what do we want to do differently and then move forward again feel no shame move forward okay we've got lots and lots of tips there which is really great from a coaching point of view, so if anybody's sitting here listening to this podcast, when do you feel it's kind of appropriate or what are the, the telltale signs that you might need some help um, from an executive leadership coach? I would say that if you're not where you want to be, whether it's whether it's sorting out a situation with your team, whether it's sorting out you know, something with your higher ups, whether it's, you know, within your own career, I think it's really like you're here and you're looking at that and you want it to be different, but you don't know how. So, you know, I employ coaches as well. I actually had a mindset coach moving through, you know, my treatment. You know, we, I suppose in some ways we often um, coach each other and and, and, and things like that. It, it's like, when you can't figure it out yourself, again, no shame uh, about that. It's like that other person, and, and the thing with coaching is it's about helping you find your own answers. And certainly a coach can draw on experience, but it always has to be what's right for the, you know, for, for the client. So I think that if things, the, the people I work with are used to success. They know success. So it's not, success is not new to them. It's when they feel that, they're not achieving that what they know is success in in, a, in any particular area. They could then benefit from somebody to, you know, work with them to help uncover what's really going on, develop strategies, and then hold them accountable. 
and I think you made a really good point there that mentors and coaches often get confused. And it's not so that a coach can't also be a mentor, but a real coach, and we're both qualified coaches, obviously, it is it is about helping the the client to come to their own answers. We're not there to tell them what to do. We're not there to um, share experiences per se. We sometimes do if, we, if we're asked to, but it's really about helping them to to come to the answers, which actually lie within them. Yes, and, and I think over the years, and, and I've done you know a lot of different forms of, of training with, with coaching and leadership and things like that, I am such a huge advocate for the person being who they are. And, and, and that's why I love the phrase authentic leadership. And, and authenticity really came out in my treatment because, you know, I couldn't be anything else but authentic really with what I was going through. And, and then, you know, realize it's a bit of a buzzword also in, you know, in the business world as well. There is space for all of us to be who we are. When we're authentic, we're actually operating at our best. That's a great platform, you know, foundation to work from. So it's about how to be an authentic leader. So how to lead as who you are and still achieve those results. So it's not, again, all about hand-holding and going, you're just the best person, you know. You know, I love you so much. It's about, well, okay, this is who you are. This is how you're wired. And you still need to be accountable and, and get those results. So how do we do that? So I just want, you know, I've been around for, for a while. I just really, my wish for people would be to stop feeling that they have to be different to who they are. They have to be a different type of person. They don't need to be any more or less. They can be who they are. And then it's about learning, you know, how to be both of those things. And, and you know, that's something else I learned in treatment and, and so many great metaphors for you know real life for professional life is that two opposite things can coexist at the same time and still be you know true so I was told I had a treatable breast cancer but I was also told it was aggressive it's like well which one is it you know <laughs> chicken or fish chicken or fish or whatever and it was actually both and I think you know you can be authentic and you can also you know, get the results. You don't have to be a particular type of person to get the business results. Be authentic and learn tools and yes, techniques. Yes, exactly, exactly. Those results. Fantastic. Hey, look, it's obvious you're very passionate about what you do. Tell me what your ideal client kind of looks like. My ideal client would be somebody that takes responsibility for themselves, that wants to learn and grow, that does know what success is like, that they have that their ego we all have ego that their ego doesn't necessarily drive them that they really have that openness for when i say betterment i'm not <laughs> contradicting what i've just said about authenticity but they really want to you know learn and grow and and achieve the results like i love results and you know i like moving forward so people that want to do that Again, I'm very clear because over the years that I've been coaching, it's important to have that cl clarity. I'm not a therapist. So it's, you know, whilst there may be a healing aspect to coaching, if they have some more healing, I would be recommending, and, and they can do both, see a therapist and, and see a coach. Hey, Cara, look, thank you so much for coming in and sharing all your wisdom with us. Amazing journey that you've been on and well done for, you know, coming out the other side in a positive, in a positive way. So that's really great. Really pleased to see it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Deborah. And we'll put Cara's um, details in the podcast notes. If you want to get in contact with Cara, you can do that. Thank you. Thank you. 